should be live on Facebook now. So good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association's Facebook page. Just waiting until I get the official version on Facebook that we are actually live. Um, I am joined today for our Tales from the Heart live podcast with Dr. Uh, Martin Marin from Tufts Medical Center in Boston, as well as the Shannon T. Mass HCM program in Morristown. Um, but I want to give our date and time. It is September 11th, 2020. It is 11.06 a.m. Eastern Time. And as this is September 11th, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the tragedy that occurred 19 years ago today and let everybody know that we still keep those individuals in our hearts and minds and being a New Jersey resident um, and witnessing the second plane as it flew down Route 287 uh, as I was going to work that morning, I could see the passengers in the plane and within 15 minutes, they were perished in the second building. Um, so this is a tough day for people all over the world. It's a tough day for people who live in the vicinities where the crashes actually occurred. And I just wanted to acknowledge that this morning. So now we're gonna get onto topics related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, so today we are going to talk about why HCM is so poorly understood by the general healthcare community, the public at large. And this is gonna be a, an interactive dialogue. Uh, Dr. Marin and I are gonna have some conversations about different aspects of why it's so complicated. And then we're gonna open it up to Q&A. Um, and we will hope that you stay on topic with us on what, what are the barriers to diagnosis and why is it hard for patients? Why is it hard for the medical community? So without any further rambling from me, uh, I'm going to welcome Dr. Martin Marin to the program. Thank you. Pleasure to be here this morning with you. Um, always an honor. So I want to say hello, good morning, and I uh, want to say hello uh, to all the HCM community patients and families out there that are tuning in or will be tuning in uh, to the program. And uh, also want to, of course, echo your sentiments about September 11th. Um, I didn't realize that you actually saw the plane. Yeah. We talked about a lot. I don't remember you telling me that. That's unbelievable. I, I will I will pause for a moment on this story because I really think it's an important one to tell because you have to tell the stories of the tragedies that you witness in yeah. life so yeah. that they're recorded. Yeah. So I was driving to my office then in Booton, New Jersey, and um, I came around the corner to my Heavenly Temptations, my coffee shop um, that I went to every morning. And as I rounded the corner, WPLJ radio went staticky, and I've never heard that before. I'm like, hmm, that's odd. And within like a block or two, I park, parked and I walked into the uh, coffee shop. And as I was walking into the coffee shop, I looked up, I heard this really loud plane. I've never heard a plane that loud outside of an airport. And I looked over and I swear I was eye level with some of the people in the plane. It's like you could see bodies and you could see the faces and everybody's looking forward. I, there was a woman, blonde hair and a guy with dark hair behind her. I will never forget their images. And I thought, well, that's kind of an odd thing, but it, it was out of my mind in seconds. I walked in the door and I saw the first plane in the building. The first camera shots were just getting there. It hadn't even set flames out yet. It was just smoke. And I, somebody behind me said, who would have flown it straight into the middle of the building? I said, somebody who meant to hit it just instinctively. Um, found out it was a state senator standing behind me. He didn't like my comments. He thought that that was rough. And I, a couple of days later, he apologized and said, you were right. But I got down to my office that morning where I was supposed to be going to a TV studio that day. I was working both of my jobs at that point. I was HCMA and HR. Um, I was going to be on the Ananda Lewis show to talk about the disparities of African-American athletes dying from HCM on the athletic field that your father had published the paper just days earlier. And uh, we were gonna talk about this and raise awareness about HCM. Um, and at that point, we heard that the second plane had hit and the TV show was canceled, um, the production was canceled, and I was supposed to be on with Duchess of York uh, Ferguson, uh, uh, Sarah Ferguson. She was supposed to be there too. They helicopter her out to Canada. That didn't get you know, said for a long time afterwards, but being in the middle of that on that day and being crushed that we weren't gonna be able to raise awareness about how the African-American community was in this healthcare disparity being uh, 
the victims of sudden death from HCM at a higher rate, that never made front page news. It never got out there because the terrorists stole the thunder. So yet another reason to hate the terrorists who bombed our country. Let me ask you just before we switch over to, to the topic, were tell us were there were there HCM patients in the towers or and or as first responders that were involved in that day? And if so, do you want to just you know, give any yeah. any any uh, anecdotes or, or stories about that or recognition? Yeah, I do. Um, Gary Valentino was a, a member. Uh, yeah. Some of you may know him by the man who wore his heart on his sleeve. If you've ever seen the picture of the guy with the tattoo with the number seven in his ICD and the HCMA tattoo on his forearm. Uh, Gary was a New York City firefighter for years. And interestingly, HCM saved his life that day. He had recently been diagnosed and had been put on house duty. So he was in the firehouse actually um, taking care of all inside stuff. They, weren't, they wouldn't allow him to go out. He tried several times and they said, no, 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 you can't go, you can't go. And he stayed at the firehouse conducting uh, communications and taking care of back end things for the front end workers. And uh, we did not lose him that day. Uh, statistically speaking, we did lose members of our community that day because over 3,000 or nearly 3,000 people died. And because of that, uh, we know some of them had to have probably been either diagnosed or not diagnosed HCMs. But Gary, um, I looked for him for days afterwards because it was hard to find him. I'm going to cry. Um, I looked for him for days. I tried to reach him. I couldn't find him. I didn't know if he was dead or alive. And about two weeks later, he called and said, hey, just wanted to let you know I'm okay. And I was relieved to, to, to hear from him again. He was a great guy. Uh, unfortunately, years later, we lost him to complications of HCM at the age of, uh, I think, 40. Um, but uh, he was a, he was, one of the bravest in New York that day. Yeah, I met, I knew Gary. He was a great guy, salt of the earth, and just um, really a complete class act. Um, Completely. He's, Completely. He, he's missed. He's very missed. <laughs> he's very missed. And, you know, sometimes when we lose somebody in this community and time passes on and we don't talk about them, it doesn't mean that their HCM experience doesn't guide us to the future. I, I know when you see people with his presentation, which was a little unusual, he comes to mind and you think about the lessons he taught us and his wonderful personality, of course, but what he taught us about HCM too. So, um, I remember wow. when he showed me his tattoo the first time, I thought it was fake. So I kept trying to, you know, <laughs> take it off of him and uh, it was clearly permanent and an impressive, uh, really kind of a symbol, you know, of, of uh, respect and, and uh, his, his connection to the disease in that way. I was always impressed that he you know, took it to that level. Yeah, so just to give people the backstory on that, we had created um, an awareness sticker um, that was in honor of sudden cardiac arrest survivors and in, in, in honor of HCM survivors. And it was just a, a little uh, piece of artwork. And he said, oh, I love that. I wanna get a tattoo and I wanna show it off for the first time at the HCMA meeting. And he actually tattooed the HCMA logo on his body and he displayed it the day of our annual meeting and everybody thought it was fake. And he's like, nope, it's there forever. Um, he just was a great guy. So we think about him today and we think about all those lost today and we're, you know, they're never far from our thoughts. Yep, agree. So now that you've made me almost cry on camera, thank you so much. Um, Let's talk about why HCM is so hard to diagnose and understand and what the confusion is. So let's talk about the name first. How many names does HCM have? Yeah, I mean, that's a good place to start because, you know, I, I don't know if, if, if everybody out there is aware that, you know, we obviously, everybody understands that we have one term now, HCM or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, HCM, but uh, that was not always the case. You know, I mean, I think we we've gone, you know, as an evolution, if you just look back over the years, I mean, there's, I think almost been upwards of 50 to even maybe more than that, different names that have been applied to this single disease, you know, over its 60 year history. 
Um, and so ultimately, you know, those different names were unified uh, to be HCM probably about 20 years ago. But, you know, part of the confusion that still, you know, I think remains to this day reflects the fact that, you know, there were in fact so many different ways that people used to describe HCM that it created confusion just based on that alone, right out of the, you know, so right out of the gate in a way. And so um, that's, uh, we've been sort of fighting that in a way uh, as well ever since. So today even, yeah, you'll have individuals say, I've been diagnosed with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, or I've been diagnosed with hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy with apical presence or apical HCM. We're still using lots of different names for the core disease and then the added features, right. which I think can confuse people too. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, that, you know, I understand how that happens. You know, people want to kind of attach more specific terms onto HCM to better, you know, better describe either for them or for that, for people they're talking to, you know, what specific type of HCM that they have. And uh, so I understand, you know, I understand sort of where that comes from. Um, and I also understand that when we do that, it does create, you know, confusion, particularly to, to those that are not well initiated or uninitiated to HCM uh, about whether or not, you know, we are talking about many different diseases rather than one disease with slightly different features to it. And so I want to be clear, you know, for those listening that, you know, we're talking about one disease um, and there are clearly different types of features because it is an incredibly heterogeneous disease. We use that term a lot. And so make sure everybody understands what we mean when we say that heterogeneous just means that the spectrum, the way these hearts look and what they can have associated with them structurally is very variable. Okay. That doesn't mean we're talking about different diseases with different outcomes and different risks. We're talking about the same disease. It's just an enormous spectrum to it. Okay. And so we, we always come back to the fact that it, uh, you, you unify all of these different types of spectrum into one name, HCM, okay? I think probably what's most, what, what may be the best example of that is the obstructive versus non-obstructive, you know, uh, division, you know, which reflects the most visible in a way feature that differentiates the two, two types of HCM whether you have, you know, impedance to blood flow out of the heart because the mitral valve is coming over and obstructing blood flow, either at rest or with exercise, that's obstructive. And people have often, because of that, said HOCM, H-O-C-M, you know, to refer to that. And then you've got those patients that don't have obstruction or non-obstructive HCM. Um, and, um, you know, again, same disease, but we're talking about the addition or not of a, of a, of an important feature, but it all comes under the same heading. So interestingly, you made me think about some, some experiences I personally had with my diagnosis very early on. So I was diagnosed with idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis at the age right. of 12. Yeah. And, um, he made me pronounce it, which was not very easy at the time. Yeah. Um, but it sounded quite impressive when somebody would say, oh, you just have a heart murmur. It's like, no, I have idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis. So, um, that said, we've debunked a lot of that name. It's not idiopathic. It's genetic. Right. The hypertrophy is variable, and there's not always subaortic stenosis present, so that name doesn't really work anymore. Um, but I was at the NIH um, for a clinic visit in 1988, I think it was. So your dad was still there in the hallways. I don't think I crossed his path, though. Um, but I was in a lobby, and I was talking to a woman, and I said, oh, yeah, we're here because we have IHSS. And she says, oh, I have ASH. I have ASH. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's a whole different thing. No, it's the same thing. It was all HCM, but we didn't know it. And we didn't know we shared a disease because we didn't share the name of the disease. So that added to some confusion, even for me, like way back when I yeah. didn't know what was going on. So uh, I thought we had different diseases, but we were in the same clinic. Yeah, so so that's right. And so for a lot of the viewers you know, out there listening, you know, it's pretty routine. You come in for your HCM visit or to be evaluated for HCM, it's it's completely routine to get an echocardiogram, the ultrasound of your heart, which is the main test that we rely on 
to make a diagnosis and to see a lot of these different features like obstruction. But you have to remember that test is actually relatively new. I mean, it was really early 1980s. There were some you know, earlier models in the mid 70s, but it was like 1980 really where we first had the, the, the ability to have routine ultrasound. And so a lot of these other names that are now incorrect reflect an era in cardiology where there was no imaging. It was maybe the surgeon, you know, going in and visually looking or feeling and then applying certain terms to the disease there um, or auscultating, meaning using your stethoscope to describe certain things. So, you know, and part of the evolution reflects the changes, the enormous changes that have occurred with technology um, in cardiology, but also of course with HCF. So, Let's dive into it from a slightly different point of view and something that we're trying to overcome here at the HCMA, and I know you're on the bandwagon too. Currently in the United States, and to those listening outside of the United States, I the, the statistics work out the same way for you, but I'm gonna use US numbers for now. Yep. So we know that there are approximately 750,000 to a million people in the United States who have diagnosable hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at this time. We also know from insurance database information that only approximately 120, 125,000 individuals are currently seeking treatment for the diagnostic codes associated with HCM. Right. So one, where are all these people hiding that are diagnosed? And two, what are the challenges? I'm, I'm gonna break this into two parts of the conversation. What are the challenges to the medical community to help to get us to diagnosis? And what are the challenges patients face in communicating their symptoms to get to diagnosis? I'm gonna let you take the first part of this. What do you think the challenges are within cardiology and within general practitioners, practices and pediatricians to get these people titrated into the right diagnostic pathway to get diagnosed? Yeah, the great questions. Let me just, you know, before I dive into the answers to those specific questions, let me just for the, you know, again, for, for, for people listening, you know, just to clarify how you began, the the the, the number of seven hundred thousand people in the United States with HCM, you know, comes from studies that have been done where you literally just take people off the street and you do an echo and you see HCM in one in five hundred of those people. Okay, and we're extrapolating that one in five hundred from just literally taking people off the street and testing them to the population of the US and we get from that the 700,000 that, that have HCM currently at any one time in the US. And as you just pointed out and you're correct, we believe that number far exceeds those that are clinically diagnosed that have made it into clinics anywhere in the US and have been given a diagnosis of HCM, which is as you said about let's say 150,000. So several fold difference there. And so why is that? And I don't think anybody knows, you know, nobody knows, you know, the, the absolute right answer to that. It's probably multifactorial, but if clearly one of the reasons is that, you know, that a large number of patients with HCM actually do so well that they never, you know, come to medical attention. Maybe they, they don't have a murmur and they don't ever develop symptoms and they live maybe their whole life um, with HCM and, and never, for that reason are diagnosed. Okay, so that has to be one of the answers, I think, which is a mm -hmm. good thing, which is a good thing because that means that for, again, a lot of people that supports the principle that this is, you know, a disease that is in a lot of patients benign, fairly benign and, and consistent with normal longevity. Okay, so I think that's a good thing. I agree. Then as part of that, as you alluded to, there are patients who um, do have some degree of symptoms or other issues that would that should lead to a diagnosis that may not, okay? Or that diagnosis is delayed too far or too much. And that gets us into the area that, you know, I think you're asking about is why is that and what can we do to improve that? And I think one of the challenges there in, is that the symptoms of HCM overlap with many other cardiac and in some ways non-cardiac diseases, 
okay? Mm -hmm. And because there is a level of appreciation and understanding for HCM in the general practicing medical community that's pretty low, that HCM is not, unfortunately, the, the first, second, or third disease that a practitioner may be thinking about when a patient presents with exertional shortness of breath, okay? It's often a young patient. They may be perceived as otherwise healthy. And, and for that reason, HCM, a genetic heart disease, is not given enough weight as a possible diagnosis early in the evaluation of symptoms than it should, okay? So the most common areas that we hear yep. people complaining that they talked to their doctor many, many times but didn't get to diagnosis is athletically induced asthma. Doctor, I'm short of breath when I exercise. Oh, you must have athletically induced asthma. But they don't do a pulmonary function test to prove or disprove that diagnosis. They go based on symptoms. Um, you have an innocent murmur. Don't worry about it. Right. You have anxiety or depression. You know, it's all psychological. Uh, mitral valve prolapse is a common misdiagnosis or misclassification, I'll call it. Um, so we have all of these patients coming and saying, I, something's off, I don't feel right. well, but getting put into a non-cardiac or a benign cardiac diagnosis, when in fact, we've not gotten to the root cause of why they're short of breath with exercise or why their heart races for no reason. So we or have- they're told, Or they're told it's in their head. You know, we hear oh, yeah. that, how many times do we hear that? where patients have been told for years sometimes that it's it's just in their head, that they just have to exercise more or eat better and those symptoms will go away. Yeah, I, I always think about my dad in this regard. My father was the last in our family to be diagnosed right. and he didn't get diagnosed until he was 59, even though the family history is quite strong. He had always been told he had anxiety Right. Um, but he also had, you know, maybe a little hypertension because he would put on fluid. So they put him on um, Valium and a diuretic for many, 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 many years. And when he got his diagnosis of HCM, he almost cried to me and said, I'm just happy I have an answer. It's not in my head. It's in my heart. Yeah. And I, I, my heart broke for my dad at that point, his entire life. Basically, he thought he had an anxiety disorder that was not well understood in the 60s and 70s and it's very stigmatizing and in fact he had had a cardiac problem the whole time and nobody recognized him yeah i mean I, I i totally echo that i mean i think one of the more powerful moments in in at least from my perspective when we're seeing patients that i you know have come to appreciate over the years is the even before giving any treatment just the power to tell somebody that they weren't make, they didn't, it wasn't a fat, these symptoms were not a fabrication of their head, that they weren't making it up, that it actually was real for something real going on in their heart. And just seeing the anxiety and the stress and, and the frustration that that has built up, up to that point, kind of start to go away so is really powerful. And uh, obviously it's a shame that patients have gotten to that point, but um, you know, that is one of the more powerful things that I think we do is to, to, to relieve that kind of anxiety. I think so as well. So we have this patient reported symptoms reporting to the doctor, right. but how many, let's talk about, you know, just cardiology. Now, I know most people who are not in the field or don't work with cardiologists on a regular basis think a cardiologist is a cardiologist. Mm -hmm. But how many subdisciplines are there within cardiology? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, so what's happened, particularly over the last 10 to 20 years, is that there have been increasing subspecialties within cardiology that have evolved because of the specific nature of diseases in cardiology that have been well described now and also treatments. And so, you know, you've got, you know, cardiologists that specialize just in the valves. They just specialize in specific types of heart failure or arrhythmias or just specifically types of, 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 of genetic heart diseases. And so there's a huge splintering. And, and, and when that happens, um, you know, there is, uh, there is sort of a, a loss of, uh, well, the other thing that, 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 let me just say, the other thing that that sort of raises is that 
because cardiology has become so subspecialized and, and complex, and there's lots more tests and complicated tests and really sophisticated imaging, et cetera, that it's hard for one general cardiologist to sort of keep up with all of that, you know, as, as much as they would like to, it's hard to do that across all of these different areas of cardiology today. And so when, when cardiologists look at giving priority to keeping up educationally in certain things, diseases that are relatively uncommon in their practice, like HCM, probably in a priority way, don't, don't you know, achieve as much weight in, in keeping up with the, the advancements and, and what's going on in that field. Nobody's fault. It just reflects the enormous, um, you know, again, spectrum out there of different areas of cardiology that require cardiologists to keep up with. And so for that reason, I think you see an increasing gap in understanding and knowledge about HCM, even among the general cardiology community, because they're faced with so much pressure and so limited time that it's difficult, it's hard to, to really give something like HCM the time that it really deserves. And so for that reason, you know, I think we, we see it not at the top of the mind sometimes of, of even cardiologists when patients come with certain symptoms. So I've recently uh, given a presentation, which will air at the end of this month in the um, American College of Cardiology HCM educational um, effort that they're putting out. And I was asked to speak on why high volume care matters. So I right. dug into some data because, yeah, no, I'm a data geek. <clears throat> and I wanted to know, what is the actual number today, 2020? How many cardiologists are there in America? And how many patients do they see on average? And the number comes out to be 2,000. So any general cardiologist, well-meaning generalist cardiologist in America, on average has 2,000 patients in their practice every year. So statistically speaking, that one in 500 number that we talked about, and then the enhances with MRI and genetics and family screenings, et cetera, we're now thinking HCM is like this one in 200-ish number. It's still a little soft right now, but around there. So yeah. in average, they're seeing 10 patients in their practice with a HCM. Year. A year. A year. Right. And at, if at in mo, a year, at, mo, at most, right. at most, right. and we know in the HCM community, you can be obstructed or non-obstructed. Those pathways of care are different. You can have a lot of atrial arrhythmia burden with or without obstruction. And each one of those pathways is different. You could be a sudden death pathway. That's different. You could be a transplant pathway. That's different. So out of the 10 patients that they're seeing, it is conceivable that they only have one in each of these pathways. That's right. And understanding the, the complexity of the tests and the evaluation and the medicine and the, the utilization of technology, devices, et cetera, when and how. That's a lot to do for 10 patients in your practice of 2000 when coronary artery disease and valve disease pay the bills and are the bread and butter of your practice. Absolutely. That's right. And you just right there, you just made the case for something you have you know, really deserve a lot of credit for among many things, but you deserve a lot of credit for this in particular, which is the development and encouragement of HCM centers of, of excellence, you know, because mm -hmm. what you just said makes the argument for why we need, you know, specific centers that have the ability to have the expertise in HCM to be able to take patients through all of these different nuances of their disease in the most effective, safe way to improve their care. Absolutely. I think the, the aha moments came for me early on in the HCMA experience because I was seeing so many people coming in with very invasive procedures being done for no reason whatsoever. A lot of cardiac caths being done, um, a lot of angiograms being done, a lot of stress tests without echoes, you know, a lot of medicines being given that were inappropriate, you know, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of um, vasodilators given for obstructive patients, a lot of diuretics given in obstructive patients, you know, just really weird stuff. And when you go to an HCM center, you weren't seeing those same pathways of, of thought. Now, as we broaden our horizons and we try to educate people more, I think what's really important to say at this point is the community cardiologist has an important role in HCM care and management. 
but we can't expect them to know everything that a center of excellence would know. So it really is collaborative care. Right, collaborative. Absolutely. And it has to be. It, it has to be. There's no question about that. And so it's a back and forth. It's a relationship that the HCM centers have to have with the, you know, with their cardiologist and the patients are, are benefiting from that. Absolutely. But I mean, I think, you know, I'll just make the point too there that, you know, you, you know, I think for those, you know, they're listening that, you know, maybe new, you know, who have been to a center, uh, perhaps a center of excellence near them um, and, and were benefited from that kind of visit. Um, you know, they know you to know that, you know, you get, you get really the credit for that, you know, because you took what was really, tw I mean, again, giving everybody perspective here, 20 years ago, there was a handful in the United States and Canada, six, that's it. People may not realize that listening, six centers coast to coast, including Canada, where there was any expertise really focused on this disease, okay? So today, when we look at that list of what it is now, 30 to 40, 41, 40, yeah, 41, you know, with the countless patients having benefited from that, you know, I just want to give you, you know, credit for that. You drove that, it was your vision. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's forever altered the landscape, as they say. And that's the hope is to get people to the quality care that they need and deserve and not make it too difficult to get to. Right. You know, my, my first goal was five hour drive because that's how long it took me to go from New Jersey to Boston when I was first going up there for care. Um, so I figured if I could drive five hours, everybody could, but that's not conceivable for most people. They can't do it. It's expensive. It's time consuming. Uh, some people don't have the transportation. So we needed to make it much more um, convenient for people. Yeah. So big we're, it, it's a big, big country and there's still areas and pockets that I'm not sure we'll ever get great coverage, but we'll do our best. A um, lot more coming up, some new exciting programs in the in the pathway um, and some new exciting ways we're trying to work on to help educate physicians as well. Yep. So all of that's happening. So we, we talked a little bit about the disciplines and then I'm gonna go to Q&A. I just wanna kind of go through who are all of the cardiology specialists that are involved in a center of excellence care model? Um, if you want to just break us down from you know the surgeons to the interventionalists and explain what their roles are to people, so they're not just hearing it from me all the time. Yeah, sure. So you know, I think that it's probably fair to say that you know of all the diseases in cardiology, HCM really stands at the top as representing a disease that draws on the expertise of all of many different aspects of cardiology care, okay? That reflects just the different aspects of this disease that are part of it. So let me give you specifically what I mean. You know, as many here know, HCM can have a abnormal a a arrhythmias associated with it, you know, upper and lower chamber. And so you need to have really good expert arrhythmia uh, care and cardiologist as part of the, the multidisciplinary team. You need, um, you need imagers, it's an imaging disease, meaning that echo and MRI are so important to diagnosis and, and prognosis that you really rely on expert imaging capabilities too. Three, it's a genetic heart disease. And so the evaluations of family members and genetic testing and the interpretation of genetic testing so important obviously in a genetic heart disease that you need expertise in genetics uh, and, 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 and genetic counseling as well. You've got, you know, as, as many know, you, procedures specific for this disease, invasive procedures. So for example, in those patients with obstruction who've been symptomatic despite drugs, who become candidates for a percutaneous approach with alcohol self-ablation. That's done by experts in the cath lab, interventional cardiologists who needs to have expertise in how to do that procedure really well in HCM. Then you've got patients that, that have been referred to and undergone surgery, cardiac surgery, the myectomy. And you need, of course, a myectomy surgeon, a cardiac surgeon with a lot of expertise in that operation to give you the kind of outcome and results that you want for your operation. You've got as well one other, and then one other point is that all those different disciplines, you know, really should are sort of what I look at as kind of spokes on the wheel. And in the middle, 
is your HCM core team. We'll call it the core team, you know, which is often, you know, a, a, a non-invasive cardiologist who's got a lot of interest and expertise uh, in HCM that can see the patients along with, you know, high level nurses and nurse practitioners, um, which are so key as well to delivering great care at multidisciplinary centers to help bring it all together and really, you know, with the patient to derive the right treatment pathway that then gets that patient referred to one of those spokes on the wheel. So two points I'm gonna drill into a little bit more here. Um, there's certain procedures and certain things that won't hurt you physically if they're not done 100% perfectly and echoes and echoes and echo. And MRI is an MRI, you're not gonna get hurt by it. You'd get expert interpretation of your data at a center of excellence. But when it comes to invasive therapies, right. surgery and alcohol septal ablation, not only do you need high volume specialists there, you need a team approach to make sure that you're getting the right approach for you. So for everybody would rather have a little needle mark and that be the end of it, but it won't fix their problem. So why have it done? So alcohol septal ablation is right for the right people and the right anatomy and the right patient population. And myectomy is right for that population. However, you don't want a low volume operator. You don't want somebody who does five alcohol ablations a year or three myectomies a year. You want somebody who does this all the time and understands the techniques to the highest degree possible to ensure the best outcomes possible. Right. And I think it's really important for those who don't understand what a myectomy is. It is an open heart procedure. It is actually a blind surgery for the most part because you're coming down the aorta you open the aorta, you go through the valve, and they're operating on a little space about, oh, what about you, big? Yep, two centimeters. Two centimeters. So, so you're, you're in a tiny little space. You don't want a novice there. <laughs> you want somebody who has skill. So high volume matters. So I just wanted to punctuate those points. But I also want to go back to the other part of, you know, the HCM director, or as I used to call them, the champions, and we, we formalize that to directors now, um, who are really running the program and bringing in these subspecialty care providers within cardiology when it's appropriate, but also helping you outside of cardiology. When you need somebody to talk to your, your orthopedic surgeon about how to use anesthesia during your knee operation, or when you're going for some other, you know, you've got cancer that's come up, you can have cancer in HCM, unfortunately, your HCM team is going to help guide your other care teams to keep your heart as safe as possible. That's their role, is to protect your HCM heart. And we can work with that. And on top of all of those issues, there are psychosocial support networks that they can guide you to. And it's okay to see a therapist. Guys, this is tough stuff. If you need a therapist, go get a therapist. If you need help from your HCM center to find one, that's great. You can come to the HCMA for that too we're all managing the best we can and we're offering more and more online support options which will be coming uh to you by the end of the month we hope uh, we're going to get those set up so there's a lot coming up there but this concept of being misunderstood is a two-sided coin the patients are misunderstood because they don't think i might have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy i better go talk to a doctor and the doctors don't see shortness of breath in a young person as a serious heart condition up front we look fine until we don't. Right. And uh, I think that's really important and that this is a team approach. And together we're getting better and better at putting these pieces together and getting public information out there. So Do you want to talk, about, can we talk, can we just talk about one other quick thing before we switch to maybe questions? Yeah. So, this is, so coming back to this point about, I think everybody, well, I think there's a large agreement that, you know, care is enhanced when a patient gets to an HCM center, okay? Mm -hmm. But that means the patient's gotta get to one, meaning we got, get, they have to at least be diagnosed or a suspicion of diagnosis raised by either their primary care or their cardiologist. And as we just talked about, we're seeing that not happen perhaps at the level we'd like to see it happen at, um, or there's a delay, you know, um, as well. And so let me ask you, I mean, I think we've talked about this a lot before, but that's a challenging area. And I think you're now focused among many things on trying to increase with na other national organizations, maybe even like the ACC, American College of Cardiology, it 
helping to increase the awareness and education, even among the, the practicing cardiology community, so that HCM is higher, so to speak, on the list of potential diagnoses. Do you want to just comment on that? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> mission one, yep. set up an organization. Mission two, get the patients organized. We're, we're, we're still working on that 25 years down the road. Um, get centers of excellence coordinated. Mm. Um, it, as silly as it sounds, the concept for the HCMA came from a picture of a triangle. Um, you can't tell the masses about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and guide them to care when there's nobody at the top of the pyramid to treat for them, to provide them with quality care. So the first step was build the top of the pyramid to guide the patients to. And now that we have you know, over 40 programs in the country and more in development, we have the knowledge base to send people to so that they don't get harmed by healthcare. And for anybody who you know, is wondering what I'm saying about that, the basis of the HCMA came from a family death due to mismanagement. My sister Lori died because she did not get high quality care. She was misled, misinformed, and, and that led to her death. And pretty much every day since then, I've been trying to stop that from happening to another family. And we have a wonderful organization behind us to help in that mission. So now that we have all these centers out there, and now that we are going to uh, have the capacity to handle the patient volume, we need to now filter more and more patients through a system of early diagnosis, and getting the referral to that center and we will be helping them with tools um, coming in 2021 there's going to be a whole new website and a whole new presence that's going to be a lot more intuitive and have more resources to the public to help guide them to the care that they need um, i really feel it's important right here to explain something about the center of excellence model um, so the, the the curious people out there are saying okay what's in it for them and I want to explain the financials of the Center of Excellence. The HCMA is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We function off of membership donations, membership dues, grants, and just general donations from the public. And when we do an investigation of a Center of Excellence, there is a fee. Uh, right now it is under $3,000. It will be increasing slightly at the time of evaluation. Now we didn't used to do this. We started this about 10 years ago. So some of the early programs got away without paying anything at all. Um, but now we charge for the evaluation of the program. We ask no financial obligation from the center beyond that. If they choose to donate on an annual basis, we appreciate it, but it is not a quid pro quo. We are going to look at the technical aspects of the center. We evaluate the thought leaders, the, the directors, the staff, the infrastructure, the, um, the leadership of the hospital system that we're working with and make sure that they're all on board with providing the best quality care possible to the HCM community. And if that institution fails in their responsibilities and they're not funding the program, we will take away the center of excellence you know, designation. Or if they have a major change in staff and they try to put people in positions of leadership that have no experience in HCM, they can lose their center status as well with us. So I think it's really important to understand that we are really doing the work to make sure patients get to the highest quality care possible. We do have a program that we can assist in appeals. Unfortunately, we have to re retain that for members only, but there are sponsorship uh, for membership available if you have a financial issue. There's, there's ways for us to help you, but we also have to keep the doors open and the lights on so we can keep the mission going. But I, I just wanna be clear that it's not a quid pro quo at any sense. So tell, maybe you could tell the uh, people out there, if you want to go and see where, where, you know, the list of centers of excellence, how do you do it? You go to 4hcm.org and you go to the directory. It's as simple as that. And you can see, you can see the list there. Now, some of the programs are newer and some of them are smaller than the bigger programs, but they, they all grow over time and enhance. And not every center is 100% equal because not every region of the country has the same resources and the same availability of certain levels of care. So they, they do differ slightly, but they are under a pretty structured concept and program. And the contact so, information and all that stuff's there. All so. the contact information, all, you, you don't need to go all to Google. You just go 4hcm.org directory, the contact number for an appointment, the location, the link back to the center's HCM page so you can learn more about their providers. And through programs like this, I'm hoping to 
raise the platform for all HCM physicians so people can get to know who they are yep. and understand their personalities. And you know, yep. not everybody finds a doctor on a piece of paper. They want somebody that they can connect with and they can communicate with and they feel understands them. And part of these communications with yourself and other physicians in the HCM field give us the opportunity to let people get to know you in a different way than they might in the clinical environment. Yep. Super helpful. Great. Okay, so if anybody has questions, now's a great time to post them. I saw some comments there, and you'll see me looking at my phone because it's easier to stream through questions there. Um, so, Marty, if if we if I gave you a magic wand and an unlimited budget, how would you go about raising awareness among medical professionals with HCM, for HCM, not with HCM? Although we do have medical professionals with HCM. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I would, you know, I would, de I would develop. You know, I think this is kind of maybe in line with what you're saying. I think you're on the right track. I think I would be developing, you know, educational material that was developed and directed at, you know, internists and 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 cardiologists that could be disseminated, and communicated, in a way to you know a large group of people like that, in the most effective way possible. That may be you know, part of that may be part of um, some of the medical uh, podcast, be, you know, getting it in there. Maybe it's webinars, maybe it's, you know, as part of uh, satellite symposiums, as part of meetings, if we ever go back to in-person meetings, you know, those kinds of things. I think we, we will go back. Yeah, we'll go back. It, it won't be soon, but we'll go back. But yeah, but I mean, I think it's a, a multi-pronged educational attack, so to speak, at different levels you know, a lot of people are getting information today in a lot of different ways, of course, than they did five or 10 years ago. I mean, I know that that obviously that's the case for me. I mean, I'm, I'm listening to podcasts, medical and otherwise on my commute. I think a lot of people are doing that. So, I mean, we have to find ways to reach the cardiologists and the internists through these platforms in a way that will change their practice. That's really where the focus, I think, at least in my mind, should be directed initially. And I agree completely. And I think um, a couple of things I'll just kind of pitch here. Number one, uh, we've hired a new volunteer coordinator. You're all going to be hearing a lot more about Julie soon um, in this podcast and in others. Um, so we, we're trying to coordinate our volunteer community a little bit more to provide more outreach services to for peer-to-peer type of support. Um, we are working on some legislative initiatives that will raise awareness to the GP community, like we did here in New Jersey. We want every well child exam to include a cardiac question, you know, some cardiac questions. Are, is there a family history of heart disease? Does a child get short of breath with exercise more than her peers or his peers? And we ask these questions in a very logical way that would help the GP, the family practitioner, the pediatrician, make that referral to cardiology for clearance and make sure that everything's okay. And this is an educational model used in a clinical setting. So if we mandate it, like we do here in New Jersey, there's an educational module that they have to take and yeah. we need to get them more informed on the diagnostic side. Um, somebody just posted uh, that we should be speaking to pulmonologists and I couldn't agree more. I've just had a hard time cracking into the pulmonology community to say if it's if the pulmonary function test is normal and there's you know shortness of breath with exercise, please refer to cardiology. You would think they would know that, but they're not getting it all the time. So I think we need to look at some of those subspecialties as well and, and reach out to them. It's a great point. Whoever brought that up, it's a great point. Absolutely. Yeah. Not just cardiology. That's right. Yes. So we have a couple questions. Um, somebody, uh, Lauren, wants to know, what can patients do to improve their HCM symptoms that are not related to medication? Um, hydration, rest, foods. Are there any go-to tips that you like? Well, I think... You know, I think what uh, one thing that comes to my mind is that, you know, mild to moderate aerobic exercise. I mean, we want patients with ACM to stay active. You know, I think, um, you know, the uh, there's evidence now that if they if patients do that, they can improve over time their functional capacity, you know, as measured, you know, through objective testing. But by 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 simple terms, that just means that they can exercise more. Um, if they get into a, a routine of mild to moderate uh, recreational aerobic exercise. And I think that also inevitably will improve their mental outlook too. So I think that's a great place to start. Yeah, nice brisk walks are healthy for pretty much everybody. 
Right. And we should be active. We shouldn't be couch potatoes. Um, so I think that does help. Staying hydrated is good. Watching your sodium level. You don't want too little and you don't want too much. You got to do that balancing act. So heart healthy makes sense. Right. Um, Carol, I can't really address your question here because it gets a little too into the diagnostics, but I will rephrase it. Um, so if there's not a lot of hypertrophy, but it's over 15, and there's a lot of mitral valve abnormality, is that something other than HCM or is that part of the confusion in the definition of HCM? Well, yeah, it's hard, it, you know, it's hard to, to comment specifically on individual patient, you know, examples or cases here, you know, so because I don't have all the information. I think as a principal rule, so to speak, you know, if, if, if a patient has ha increased wall thickness of 15 millimeters or more and the mitral valve abnormalities that are being, you know, raised here include what we call systolic anterior motion, creating obstruction to blood flow, um, then those two features are classic for obstructive HCM. Could they be something else? I mean, it, the, there's always the possibility it could be something else. There are, we didn't get into this, but let's talk about it for a second here. There are other diseases, um, both in pediatrics, kids and adults that cause increased thickness to the heart muscle even some that cause increased thickness of the heart muscle that can have obstruction that are not HCM. There are other diseases. We call them mimickers of HCM. And most of them are other types of genetic heart diseases. And so the answer to, to, to that patient's question is it could be something else that's possible. Although I would say that the likelihood usually of one of those other diseases is low, very low. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to just name a few things here. So we're, when we talk about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in adults, we tend to talk about sarcomeric mutations and the undiagnosed, no genetic uh, variant found in the sarcomere as being hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in adults. There are other diseases that have the presence on imaging that looks like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in adults and children. And they can include things like sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, Fabry's disease, Dannon's disease, mostly in, in kids, well, not necessarily, but all, not always, um, Noonan syndrome. They can have HCM looking hearts, but they have a different genetic etiology for this abnormality. So sometimes they're treated the same for their thick hearts as HCM people are. And sometimes there are different treatments for them such as Fabrase has an enzyme replacement, amyloid has medications now that are targeted to amyloid disease. So there are specific treatment pathways for each of these spectrum disorders as we're going to be referring to them from here on out, that it's really important to know what your etiology is. What is your base cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on imaging? Does it have a genetic definition? And I think understanding that as complicated and, and as confusing as some of these disease processes can be, and there's a lot of syndromes, there's a lot of pediatric syndromes that can have LVH and a pediatric cardiologist will call it HCM. But right. for the people in the Dannon's community, I often see them say, I have Dannon's and HCM, but they really have Dannon's disease and an HCM phenotype. Did that make sense? It, it did to me, but I, I, mean, I don't know if I'm a good barometer. It's, okay. I, mean, I, I hope our listeners understood it and they're happy. They're welcome to call and, and clarify. I think, I think for the listeners, I think the point is that there can be, there can be in really rare instances, other diseases that could look exactly like HCM. And that's another reason why you really should be evaluated at least once in a center of excellence to make sure that that other scenario is not at play. So I, I'm going to qualify what you just said. I think everybody with HCM should get to a center of excellence for an assessment early in their diagnostic process and, and get on the right pathway. Right. But you can't stop there. Things change. If we go back to what we thought 10 years ago and what we know today, there's differences. Right. There are new techniques that we can look for risk factors. There are different 
thoughts on medication. There are different devices. So we need to take a look at all of that in context, but you have to check back in. I'm always reminded of the, the uh, gentleman who was in his late 30s who went to a center of excellence for one evaluation. In the early days of MRI, they didn't use um, gadolinium yet. Right. And he had his MRI and he went home and he never went back to the center. And three years later, he had a cardiac arrest and he survived mm. with severe brain damage mm. and it has destroyed his life. And it turns out that when they went back and they looked at him again and they did another MRI and they used gadolinium, they found like 24% scar, 25% scar and that things had changed. So you can't just think it's going to stay where it is. It, it evolves, HCM changes, and you need to check in periodically. Yep. Okay, so another question, um, Barbara, yes. So can you get in touch with people in your geographic area? Part of our new website design and the back end is going to make that a lot easier for regional communication among HCMA volunteers and HCMA members. Um, the Facebook group is great for that as well. Um, you're welcome to join any of the groups we have and the su online support groups. We are, we're, we're evolving on how they're gonna work. We thought they were gonna be regionally based, but they're gonna be some that might be regional and some that may be topic specific or presenter specific. So we have some pretty and unique personalities who are great at communicating information, but some of them come from different points of view. So I think you might find, I really like person A's presentation style and how they address a meeting. So we won't lock you into a region. We're, we're still working on how we're going to roll that out and all of your input is greatly appreciated. Um, so there's a question on Entresto, do we use it in America? And then there was a question about clinical trials in uh, at Morristown, whether they're opening up or not. So if you can address the status of clinical trials in COVID times, and where are we with Entresto for HCM? So Entresto is a kind of a newer drug that uh, has been shown to have benefit in other non-HCM types of heart failure. And at the moment, we don't know whether it has the same benefit in HCM. Okay, we don't know that yet. There is currently, the drug is made by Novartis. Currently, Novartis is sponsoring a clinical trial with, with Entresto that's just beginning in non-obstructive HCM. So it's not for patients with obstructive disease, it's for non-obstructives first to see if there's benefit in that population because that's the population that most may be most applicable to a benefit with Entresto. So if you're interested um, in uh, learning more about whether you wanna be involved in the Entresto study, uh, I think clinicaltrials.gov on the website, uh, as a website can tell you, if you just search it, can tell you which participating sites are enrolling for that study, which is just beginning. So I'll tell you that we have a, a nice filter on the HCMA website. I don't even know if you know this. It's called Antidote. If you go to our clinical trials page, you can put in your clinical profile. Uh, you don't have to identify yourself. It can be anonymous. Um, and it will provide you with a list of current uh, clinical trials that are available for somebody in your profile. So it'll tell you where they are located and how to get involved with them. So we've tried to eat, make it a little easier than going to clinicaltrials.gov and weeding through them all. It's yeah. got a filter on top of it. So just go to 4HCM.org, go to the clinical trials tab and look at the red box and fill out the questions and it'll guide you to where the clinical trials currently are. That's super helpful. That's great. And, and as far as the second question, I mean, I think that the answer is that as far as clinical trials in the in the COVID era, I, I think uh, COVID time here, I think the, um, the answer is it's regional. I mean, I, I, like everything else, you know, related to COVID, um, you know, a lot of the decisions about starting up clinical trials is regionally dependent, depending on, you know, what's going on with the disease in that area it will probably influence dramatically uh, an institution's decision to restart or not something like a clinical trial. Morristown is starting pretty soon to re to get going again, I, I should say, with clinical trials. So someone was asking specifically about Morristown. I think we're a couple of weeks away from getting the green light to go. In Boston, we've been, you know, we've been enrolling in clinical trials here for probably about four to six weeks. That's good to hear. Yeah, New Jersey had a slight peak in their numbers um, 
right. so I think they're going to be a little bit more. I think we went up to two percent for COVID. Uh, so I think we have to wait till that goes back down to under one for for doing that. Um, the the link for clinical trials um, for HCM is for hcm.org. Choose the clinical trial tab, and it, all the information's right there. <coughs> Excuse me. My last uh, question that I'll, I'll address today. Um, and don't worry if you have more questions. Dr. Marin's going to be joining us once a month now for the next couple of months, and I'm probably after that too. But we've announced three of these sessions, um, and every other week I'll either be speaking with Dr. Dr. Marin or Dr. Harry Lepper of the Cleveland Clinic, and we're going to cover different topics. So you can come visit us Fridays at 11 a.m. every other week, starting this week, and you will get some new content live. Um, you can always rewatch these broadcasts later. Um, so Michelle asked if your primary card. I hope card Harry is doesn't get more. Is, is, I hope I don't I hope Harry doesn't outdo me. I'm nervous now. It's competition. You got to bring it, Marty. You got to bring I, it. I don't have to really bring the thunder because I'm worried about that. Um, he's a force. So I'm glad you're. I'm glad you have him. He's he's a incredibly thoughtful senior person yeah. who's been in the field for so long. So his perspective will be really helpful. I couldn't agree more. And while he's heading towards retirement, he certainly is not leaving the HCM community as we will keep him engaged here in many different ways in the future. That's one of them. But one of the other things that we're all hoping to do, Harry and Marty and myself, is to bring in other physicians and have more engaging conversations, kind of how we talk when we're going to a cardiology conference, kind of sitting on the sidelines going, okay, what do you think about this and that? We want to bring you into that conversation. We want patients to hear the thought processes and what's going on and where there's still some questions to be answered and come up with new ways of dealing with it. So we're really happy to have them. So the one question that scooted by me uh, was my primary cardiologist is in the same center as a center of excellence. Should I just have my doctor confer with the center of excellence or should I go see the center of excellence? And I'm going to give the HCMA answer and Marty, you can give your answer. I would say go to the center of excellence physicians in that pod and go see them and have your current cardiologist talk to them after you've seen the HCM center. Sometimes, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, there are politics within cardiology. And sometimes people don't wanna give up patients for whatever their reasons. So I think it's just better for the patient to say, I would like to go to the center of excellence team, see what they have to say, and at that point, if you choose the cardiologist you started with as your primary, that's fine. But you may just want to cut the middleman out and go straight to the HCM center. It's it's very individualized decision making there. So do you agree or disagree? Yeah, I, mean, I generally agree. I'll just expand on that by saying that you know there are a lot of nuanced conversations that deal that deal in HCM that deal with management, and I think they are most effectively communicated to patients in person, face to face you get so much more out of a visit with any physician, but in particular, I think a center of excellence when we're talking about, you know, the, these issues related to ACM, that, you know, you'll come out of that, you know, with a much deeper understanding of your situation than if you heard it second or third hand through your cardiologist who's telling you what he was told by that, you know, center of excellence cardiologist. So for that reason alone, there's no question that uh, an in-person visit is the right decision. Couldn't agree more. We've taken a lot of your time today and I thank you for being so liberal with it. We went a little bit over, but that tends to happen when we start talking. So Marty, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. We will see you back here in two weeks where we will have another engaging conversation and uh, we're gonna keep these going. So if you have topics that you're interested in, by all means, Send us suggestions to support at 4hcm.org. Post them here on Facebook. We're happy to listen to what you guys want to hear about. We want to talk about what's important to you. And I'm also going to remind you that on Thursday evening, September 17th, the HCMA Big Hearted Tour will make another stop. You can register at our website or through Facebook here. Um, and on Thursday, we're going to be meeting with the team from Cleveland Clinic and our uh, our faculty will include Melinda Sai, Harry Lever, and Nick Smadira. So if you want to hear straight from the surgeon's mouth <laughs> or straight from the 42-year experienced physician or from Melinda Sai and his experience, 
please join us Thursday night, 6 p.m. Eastern time for that broadcast. But we do ask that you sign up and come into the Zoom room meeting. Um, it's a webinar. We will be uh, streaming on Facebook. The Q&A will not take place on Facebook. It will be taking place in the webinar software. It's just a little easier to manage for us. So uh, we hope to see you all join us then and sign in. And um, I hope to see you guys all at our future podcast. Thanks, Marty. Thanks, Lisa, and thanks for everybody else for tuning in. I appreciate it. Thank you for the time. Absolutely. Stop live stream.